folks, it's Dave Isaacs with you, and today I want to take a look at an iconic blues solo. This is the intro to Albert King's Crosscut Saw, what a lot of people might refer to as a blues rumba. We are in the key of A flat, and by the way, guitar players, you should not be afraid of the key of A flat, because if you can play a G minor pentatonic, you can play an A flat minor pentatonic. Not a big deal, right? So we're going from the fourth position. The note A flat is here on the fourth fret of string six as well as string one. Here is our familiar, hopefully, minor pentatonic of four, seven, four, seven, sorry, four, seven, four, six, four, six, four, six, four, seven, four, seven. Root is here, here. So fret four of the low E string octave is fret 6 of the D string, an octave of that, fret 4 of the high E. So, I'm playing against a backing track, and let's just reference this real quick so I give credit where credit is due. Uh, this backing track is by Kyle Sexton. I just found it by searching. Good job, Kyle, and I will link to you um, so that people can check out your stuff. Um, sometimes easier in these videos to use backing tracks somebody else made than the original recording. You know how that goes. In any case, this is the opening solo, the intro. And I've really come to believe that learning intros is a great way to start learning improv phrasing. Because an intro, I think, actually has to be more memorable and more melodic and less just licky, for to coin a term, than a solo. Obviously, a solo still has to be memorable. But an intro generally is just one chorus, and so you don't have a whole lot of time to get your ideas across. Plus, you haven't gotten to the hook, you haven't gotten to the main part of the song, so you really need to make it be as much a part of the song melodically as the melody itself. It's going to be one of the things people remember just as much as they remember that middle solo, if not more. And so I think learning from, particularly when you're just getting started on this stuff, starting with those short 12-bar intros is going to make life a little easier than trying to learn long choruses, uh, long solos of two, three, four choruses where there's so much more to process. And this is so neatly played because the phrasing is crystal clear. Call and response, A flat minor pentatonic. I'm starting off in this fourth position with a note on the fourth fret, second string, first string. We're going to cut that third note a little short. This one gets cut short too, with a very small bend. So notice the timing. A one, a two, a three. Two, three, four, one. So this is once again still your fourth position. Note my fingering. This is an extended reach, middle and ring are reaching up to fret 7, and you should be aware that especially when it comes to bending, you will be able to reach just as far with the ring finger as you will with the pinky if you have the hand turned this way and think of this as being an extension. Notice how my index finger is curled at both knuckles, and my hand is not parallel to the fretboard. It's rotated outward, and this allows me to extend fingers rather than having to stretch them. Having the neck a little elevated helps too. So notice how much strength I have for this bend with middle behind ring. And then index is coming off of four to help support. And then right back to that. Now, we're jumping up to a pentatonic extension. Some of you may be familiar with this. I am now in the seventh position, but I'm going to bend with three fingers. Ring is on nine on the first string. And then index ring on the second string. So it's nine bend, seven nine. If you have any doubt about the influence of Albert King on Eric Clapton, that lick should be enough to dispel those doubts right now. And we're going to answer that lick with... So this is part of that pentatonic extension. In fact, if I walk up from the familiar fingering... be familiar with that. So basically it's just from wherever your initial position is, in this case it's four, 
I'm gonna shift up really three frets and have this box. So in this case, the extension would be four, seven, four, six, four, six, four, six, eight, seven, nine, seven, nine. So this second pair of licks of the, of the intro, he's up in this position, one, two, three, four, and two, three, four, one. Now notice that index finger bend from the second string note here on nine. Now that's a little trickier to bend with one finger. Notice the way that I get there is I'm using my arm. So this is not purely just pushing up finger against thumb because I won't have the, it's a lot harder to do, but getting the arm behind it. And as a rule, I generally advise that people don't do a lot of this, but when it comes to manipulating the strings, your arm really is a big part of the picture, and so this is all part of the mechanism that can be involved. You just want to, you just don't want to stay locked like that. Now, straight back to fourth position. One, two, three, six, four, four, pull off. So, one and two and three. And then, that same bend, but reaching up. Once again, shades of Eric Clapton, or rather, Eric Clapton is shades of Albert King. Four, seven, four, six, small bend. So, if that doesn't remind you from Strange Brew, there it is. So, I'm going to play this once again. Uh, with the backing track, which again is linked below, and thank you for that. So check it out. Now, I should mention that I am not going to swear 100% that this is where he fingers it. However, you know, in some ways, some of the bends are easier if we do it. And I do like the sound of it up here, and I think this is probably, or very likely, the box Eric Clapton might use. Not sure. And to tell you the truth, I think the high E string sounds maybe a little bit thin, although I'm playing on a, a slimline uh, Les Paul Special Epiphone, and Albert King was playing on a Flying V, which is going to be a thicker sounding guitar, probably. But because this fingering is probably the most familiar to a beginner lead player, I think this is a good place to start. And then we can always choose to transpose it up here, or that would be a great ear exercise for you. But anyhow, um, as always, I am going for a solidly accurate approximation, let's say that. And of course, any solid blues player is going to play those intros differently each time. But for learning purposes, this is just crystal clear, such a great example of blues phrasing and a nice fat tone and a variety of types of bends. And so it's a great way in. You know, one thing that a lot of people do wrong when they're interested in blues, pardon me, is they go right to Stevie Ray Vaughan and try to play Pride and Joy, and that's fantastic. But it really does help, and you've heard probably Stevie Ray and Eric Clapton and Joe Bonamassa and all these people say, go back to the roots, go back and listen to the people they learned from. Because you'll have a much easier time understanding how they do what they do when you see where it comes from. And also, the phrasing is simpler, the notes don't go as fast, it's just physically easier to do, but it also provides you a great musical foundation. So here it is once more against Kyle Sexton's backing track, and Kyle, thank you again, I've got you linked down below, as well as to the tab. Here we go. <laughs> So there you have
have it as blues leads go, it's not all that complicated, but as I said, it works through a whole variety of bends. Of course, it's the flavor, the sound, that spawned an entire generation, two or three generations at this point, of electric blues guitar players. So enjoy this. This is going to be an ongoing series of looking at these intros because I really think, as I said, that they're a great way to learn about phrasing because they force you to be economical. I am Dave Isaacs. Thank you for watching. If you don't subscribe to this channel, please do. And please share if you like what you're seeing. Always love to hear your comments as well. And I'll see you next time.